internal conviction review unit, which is gaining popularity in state as well as in the country. And, it, and for the students involved, it's a, where the district attorney's office begins to investigate their own convictions to make sure that there are parts of the case that could not be overturned or to make sure that their conviction was a solid conviction. So the first question relates to that. Uh, do you believe that the Durham County District Attorney's Office should have an internal conviction review unit? And we'll go with Mr. Batista. Uh, my answer to that would be no. And the reason I say that is I believe the Broome County area is too small to have a unit that's going to be staffed by numerous individuals or additional individuals. I think it's going to lead to an increase in expense, and it's not a reasonable expense for our taxpayers, and it's going to lead to more bureaucracy. I think if there is a request to review, I think the district attorney, in conjunction with your chief assistant district attorney or chief assistant district attorneys, as well as investigators, can review those cases on a case-by-case -case basis. Some district attorneys in New York State do have those, but those district attorney's offices are a lot bigger than the Broome County District Attorney's Office. Additionally, the Attorney General's Office does have programs such as this that are more than willing to offer assistance at any time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kortek? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as far as a conviction review unit, uh, the Broome County District Attorney's Office at this point in time has a very experienced staff of <coughs> prosecutors with probably 200 years worth of experience prosecuting cases in the, the county courts. We review each case and we have a staff of skilled attorneys that review each case before it even goes to a grand jury to make sure that there's sufficient evidence and that the right person is being charged. I mean, that's really the responsibility of the district attorney's office to not go forward on the prosecution unless they know beyond a reasonable doubt that the person is the person that committed the crime and that a crime was committed. Uh, there are many mechanisms for criminal defendants uh, within the criminal justice system to challenge convictions. Obviously, we have the Third Department uh, Appellate Division, we have the New York State Court of Appeals, and defendants, if new information comes forward, are free at any time after conviction to file a motion to get the, the conviction reviewed. So this is already being done in the Broome County District Attorney's Office. Uh, it was done just recently with the case of Timothy Bale. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with that, the younger people won't be. But this was a conviction back in 1989 where an individual uh, was convicted of murder, rape and murder of a pregnant woman in the city of Binghamton. It was taken to trial, he was convicted and got 49 years to life. He had been challenging that conviction ever since. Even though he signed a confession, at that point in time, the videotape system was not in place to record uh, defendant interviews. Uh, the Broome County District Attorney went forward and said, yes, we'll agree. We'll agree to a uh, DNA sample from the criminal defendant to match it or see if it doesn't match the DNA sample that was found at the crime scene, or, or rather on the body of the uh, victim. Uh, came back as it was a match. So it was verified that Timothy Vail was guilty of that violent rape and murder. And the district attorney's office is currently constituted, has no problem making sure that the right person has been convicted. Thank you. Thank you. I would implement a conviction, what we call a conviction integrity unit. And the reason I would is because of my years of experience as a criminal defense attorney, as well as my years as a judge. Um, I have experienced, I have seen situations where I feel that there were statements that were coerced, that there were identifications, uh, there were confessions that were coerced. The Attorney General's Office is, and the District Attorney's Association are all having mixed decision making with regard to whether or not to implement it. I think it's imperative that we don't question a situation where someone's life and liberty is in question. And the problem we have right now is that the only time that you can reopen a conviction is based upon a very antiquated remedy, which is the DNA. If there's a new evidence with regard to DNA, that is the sole basis on which a new conviction, uh, which a new trial can be looked into. That is very narrow-minded, and most states don't follow that. There are case law cases involved that what we need to do is that has to be expanded. If there's other evidence, then maybe we should take a look at it. But we've heard the horror stories of individuals who are wrongfully convicted. And quite frankly, that is something that I think if someone is standing in wrongfully convicted, we have a responsibility to look into that case. Thank you. Thank you.
keeping with our random format, question number two, we'll begin with candidate number two. <clears throat> we'll ask Mr. Korczak. Um, changes have been made in New York State bail laws starting in 2020. And there are going to be multiple changes for the students who have heard me talk about it. There'll be changes to cash bail. Is cash bail available for a misdemeanor or not? Um, Mr. Korczak, how would you implement the changes to the New York State bail laws? Uh, un unfortunately, they didn't uh, take my opinion when they made the bail reform uh, law, but it does go into effect in January of 2020, and every district attorney's office throughout the state is going to have to deal with it. Um, the law indicates that there are certain qualifying offenses for which uh, you receive bail. Those are most violent felony offenses and all sex crime offenses. But there's non-qualifying offenses where no bail is set, uh, where either the defendant is released on his own recognizance or put into a pretrial release program or an electronic monitor. Those are low-level misdemeanors and low-level felonies, like Class E is the lowest felony that there is in New York State. So those, sent, those um, rather, Class E felonies would be subject to this uh, no bail. Uh, you'll be given an appearance ticket when to appear in court um, and to come back and face the charges. Now, traditionally, um, Judges took different things into consideration when they were considering setting bail or not setting bail. Ties to the community, the um, proof in the uh, case, as well as the possible sentence that the defendant could receive. This new bail law says that that can't be considered, and it's really just whether you're going to return to court or not. This creates a burden on the probation department because they're in charge of the pretrial release program. When someone is released into pretrial release, they're monitored by a probation officer. They could be subject to drug testing. They have to be checking in with the uh, Department of Probation. Now, how would we implement these changes? Um, it's through education of the ADAs, and we're already in the process of doing that, so we can hit the ground running on January 1st, 2020. Uh, again, it's the duty of the district attorney to follow the law, no matter what it is, and follow the bail laws as they're written by the state of New York. You can't keep someone in bail on a charge indefinitely in fear of what they might do in the future. That's not permissible and that would be unethical. Thank you, Ms. Burchett. Ms. Nelson? Thank you, I would also implement the law. The law is in, the legislature has so implemented the fact that we are gonna have criminal justice reform. And criminal justice reform is only going to be as good or as efficient as the district attorney's office and the district attorney who implements it. So I would concur that what we need to do is we need to have early screening. We need to look at those cases and those individuals on a case-by-case -case basis early on, make sure that the appropriate charges are there. But we certainly want to weed out the cases where the community is not at risk because the cost and the expense to the taxpayer is approximately $70,000 per year per inmate. And we want, it's an enormous cost that quite simply, there are just a number of individuals who shouldn't be there. At the same point in time, we must be very careful that we protect the community so that we don't release individuals who could be, cause violence or impact and harm any individuals. Education and teamwork. It's a new law, it's gonna to have to be followed. And as district attorney, we have to ensure the law is being followed. It's going to be incumbent that we ensure everybody in the office is fully aware of all these changes, and they're sweeping changes. It's going to be a lot different. Uh, people are going to be appearing for arraignment with appearance tickets. We're going to have to see how people are showing up, aren't they showing up? There's various provisions written into this new legislation as to how we have to ensure individuals are going to reappear and what the specific fence is. For misdemeanors now, but for a couple of exceptions, individuals are going to receive an appearance ticket, and then they're going to show up within 20 days, ultimately coming to court. Felonies, but for violent felonies with a couple exceptions, even eight felony drug offenses aren't going to be looking at bail anymore. They're going to be released in their own recognizance, and we're going to have to be looking at individuals that are coming up from New York City, reside in New York City, committing crimes in Broome County, and then they're released in their own recognizance. It's going to be difficult. We're going to have to work together as a team. We're going to have to implement in-house training session. We're going to have to put different programs in place to ensure every assistant district attorney, in working in conjunction with probation, pretrial services, put together a team approach to ensure the safety of our community is our number one priority. It's not one person, it's gonna be a team approach. We're gonna to have to ensure that all the judges by going out to the different magistrate meetings are fully aware of this. We have a lot of local court judges that may not be aware of this. 
We have to ensure when individuals appear at the correctional facility for the cap arraignment, the assistant district attorney on staff is aware of the different rules. So it's definitely going to be new. It's new legislation. It's new law. We're going to have to follow it. We're going to implement it. And we're going to work together in a team approach to ensure that everybody in my office is fully aware of this and we can do everything we can to help the community be the best and safest it can possibly be. Thank you. Now to our third question, this question will go to uh, Mrs. Gelson. Uh, how has central booking at the sheriff's office changed how the Broome County District Attorney's Office will operate? Well, the changes, uh, from what I understand, have been that essentially initial appearances are conducted at the jail with regard to reviewing an individual who first comes into the jail. Uh, that's done by our local magistrates who will, on a rotating basis, come in, um, essentially advise the individuals as to the rights. Public defender is there to represent them, as well as a member of the district attorney's office is there. Those are conducted twice a day, um, at 8 o'clock uh, in the morning and at 8 o'clock at night. Uh, that's an important factor in terms of individuals' rights, in terms of moving the process along, as well as in terms of keeping the system efficient. I would certainly support and continue what was being done with regard to that. I think it's important that we have it protects this community. It lessens the amount of transportation we need to have with regard to inmates, uh, and it expedites the system that we need to have moving because we just have so much that we need to proceed with. Mr. Contesti? Um, obviously, we're doing arraignments now at, in the morning, roughly 8.30, and then in the evening at 8 p.m. I think it's very efficient. You know where your client's going to be. You know where to go. They bring them in. You arraign them. It's definitely going to be different for the staff within the Broome County District Attorney's Office because Broome County, unlike a lot of other counties, do not have night courts. So individuals are going to be working later hours. So they're going to have to look at flex time, who's covering what and when, who's available. Additionally, who's ever covering that arraignment, as I just previously discussed, is going to have to be well aware of all the bail reform. A lot of times you'll still see people coming in at the cap, but it's going to be a lot different when we're addressing January 1, 220. Because a lot of these individuals that are coming in are individuals that were just arrested during the day for misdemeanors or felonies or offenses that are no longer going to be immediately brought before a judge. They're going to be issued appearance tickets. And those appearance tickets are going to bring people back to the jurisdiction in the misdemeanor court where the offense occurred. So the cap is working well. I fully support it. I love to possibly see expansion where possibly, assuming we're all aware of all the facts, dispositions can occur there which would be consistent with judicial economy and economic efficiency. But I think you're going to see the participation in the cap from criminal defendants be much less come January 1. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, my position on the um, arraignments is a very positive one. Um, in fact, it was implemented a little too late for my taste because uh, the arraignments are at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. and must be staffed at those hours. Uh, when I was serving as the judge in the town of Union, it was 24-hour arraignments. So they would wake you up in the middle of the night, drag you down to the courthouse, and um, make you do the arraignment with sometimes very little information, which was very difficult uh, when you were a judge at that point in time, uh, also when you were half asleep. Of course, as soon as I left being judge in the town of Union to take the position as chief assistant district attorney, they implemented this system where you didn't have to get up in the middle of the night. But uh, it has uh, created challenges for the uh, staff of the Broome County District Attorney's Office uh, based on the fact that you have to have someone at the arraignment at 8 a.m. and then again another uh, round of arraignments at, uh, at 8 p.m. Uh, the staff at the DA's office is currently constituted has really stepped up. Uh, we've all covered for each other, made sure that there was an ADA staffing those arraignments. Uh, it's very difficult because you could be there till late in the evening and then have a case that you have to present to the grand jury first thing in the morning. So we've done a good job of juggling people's schedules and making sure that all the, uh, all the arraignments uh, are covered. Uh, I do agree that this uh, should be expanded. That would be a good idea. However, um, I don't agree that dispositions will be able to take place at the arraignment as much as we'd like them to uh, because there's new discovery laws coming in on January 1st. Those, those discovery laws will mean that the criminal defendant must have every piece of paper, every police report, uh, every witness statement before they're even allowed to plead guilty. So that wouldn't be a practical way of doing it because it wouldn't be um, something that you could do under law because my understanding of the law is not waivable. This discovery uh, statute, and we're going to talk about that I think in a couple questions uh, coming up, 
is non-waivable. Uh, these discovery uh, laws that have been implemented have to be followed by the district attorney's office. And again, you must follow the law. You're ethically bound as district attorney to do just that. Thank you. Sir. That is correct. The next question actually happens to be about the changes in New York State discovery laws. Uh, there have been multiple changes, and the new district attorney's office will have to handle those changes. Um, the question goes back to our number one uh, candidate, Mr. Battisti. How will your office implement the changes in the New York State discovery law? The blindfold law, the new discovery procedures. It's going to be definitely, definitely interesting. Uh, new kind time constraints on when the prosecution must disclose a release information to criminal defendants and their attorneys. The only way this is going to work is through a teamwork approach with members of law enforcement. There's got to be an element of trust. There are certain safety provisions written into this new law that will protect witnesses and different victims. Some of the information still can be redacted, but a lot of information that currently is not disclosed will be disclosed. I think it's going to be incumbent upon members of law enforcement in the district attorney's office to sit down and meet as a team and come up with a memorandum of understanding. There's got to be a memorandum of understanding. We've got to ensure that the information that we need to give to the defense is provided to us in a timely manner, provided to us with enough time where we can review it to ensure that we're giving what we need to give. It's definitely going to, uh, definitely going to require training within our office because it's going to be much different than anything we've ever seen. It's a lot all at once. So it's going to be changed, and with change comes resistance. But I think working together as a team, not just one individual, we can comply with this. And I do think um, it can be effective. And I do believe it can speed up the legal process so we don't have individuals waiting and waiting and waiting for their day in court. Thank you. Again, they didn't uh, consult with me before they did this. This is a big challenge for a district attorney's office. Uh, there are current uh, discovery rules in place under Criminal Procedure Law Section 240. That's going to be repealed as of January 1st, 2020, and there's a new uh, discovery statute that's been implemented. Now, it really benefits the criminal defendant, which I, I have nothing against everyone having a level playing field and getting a fair trial. However, it does put a, a big burden on the district attorney's office as well as the police departments to supply all this information as soon as possible. Um, to the criminal defendant who's been charged with the crime. Uh, the clock starts basically on your speedy trial time. Uh, as soon as the uh, individual is arraigned in a local court on a felony complaint, that starts the clock on the uh, speedy trial. And on a, on a felony case, uh, the people have to be ready for trial within six months. Uh, again, that's um, going to be a big challenge to get all the uh, paperwork together. My one concern, and a major concern with the district attorney's office, is the statute indicates that there's automatic discovery, certain items that have to be turned over from the prosecutor to the defense attorney before the defendant can even plead guilty. Uh, this involves grand jury transcripts. That's an added expense to provide those to a defense attorney. Um, witness statements, defendant statements, any tapes or recordings that could be used uh, during a trial. All this has to be provided up front. Where we are now in the discovery statute is it happens right before trial. Um, this is a burden, especially for a district attorney's office, because when you turn over uh, video that's been taken in and around a crime scene, oftentimes you have police officer body cams. They have them on, and they're interviewing witnesses, and some people do not want to be identified. So you're going to have to go to a judge and get a protective order to make sure this person's identity is not revealed. You know, we're very concerned at the district attorney's office, and we're already working on putting this in place for January 1st, how we're going to protect our witnesses and protect our victims in these cases. Thank you. Thank you. Implementing the new discovery rules will be challenging. However, it must be remembered that it's already been done by 45 states prior to this. New York, unfortunately, was one of the last states to implement the new discovery rules. Discovery rules that are being implemented in New York in 2020 are fundamentally similar to that which I have been addressing and dealing with as both a district attorney, a judge, and a defense counsel uh, in the state of New Jersey for 30 years. So yes, it will be challenging. It's going to require us to have close working uh, and good relationships with law enforcement with investigations, uh, as well as with uh, a lot of uh, uh, various 
partners um, in various agencies that will be dealing with on both federal and state levels. But it can be done, and I know how to do it. Thank you. This next question relates to Raise the Age, and for the juvenile justice students, Raising the Age uh, happened in New York State. It will be fully implemented by the end of the year. Um, there are changes in which juveniles are going to stay in the family court system longer. Um, question goes to Mr. Korczak. Uh, how will your office continue to deal with the changes in Raise the Age? Okay, thank you. Well, we're already continuing to deal with it. Um, it was implemented already for 16-year-olds, and come October 1st um, of this year, it's going to be 17-year-olds. that are really going to be classified as what's called adolescent offenders. Uh, there's a youth part where they'll be transferred to or go on to family court, and we're continue, continuing to deal with this. It's a very complicated procedure that's been implemented. Uh, it does appear that prosecutors were not involved in the, uh, in the rules on this because this is a very complicated um, situation. I actually participated in the first arraignment in Broome County in the uh, youth part, and it's really a matter of bringing everyone together. Um, in order for an arraignment to take place when someone is charged as an adolescent offender, the DA is notified, the public defender is notified, a ju special judge has to come in, a special courtroom has to be found, there's a court stenographer, the county attorney is notified, probation is notified, as well as the parents of the person that's charged. Once everyone gets together, which takes quite a bit of time, um, then the arraignment actually takes place and a decision is made as to whether to release the adolescent into the custody of their family or to um, commit them somewhere um, to a, a facility, a secure facility for, uh, for youth. That's another problem that no one really told us about when we got started on this program because there are really only two facilities available to us to house someone who's charged as an adolescent offender if that's the decision that the judge made. There's Valhalla, which is like three hours away, or Syracuse, which we have trouble finding space for adolescent offenders there. Um, so we do have on-call ADAs to handle this. Uh, we have on-call ADAs for every aspect of our, uh, of our office, whether it's narcotics, violent crimes, sex crimes, uh, as well as raise the age. Uh, we've already implemented this and we're well prepared for the uh, second stage of it that's coming uh, in October of this year. Thank you. Raise the age was implemented because prior to this 16 and 17 year olds go to up, essentially be, and I've represented a number of them, gone to prison upstate. 16 and 17 year olds still need rehabilitation, and that's why they have put back again the youth court. So effectively what we need to do is we're gonna to need to work together with all of the various agencies in the program, the district attorney's office, public defender, probation, diversionary programs, and as well as obviously we need to have a local juvenile facility for these individuals. And we all need to work together to again address the needs of these very young people that are, that we recognize it's too young to send, they are still individuals that we can help. Um, that's what the legislative intent, that's the purpose of Raise the Age, is to continue for rehabilitation for these youthful offenders. We can, these are our young people. We can't give up on them. And unfortunately, I've represented also too many who went to upstate prison at 17, 18 years old. Their lives were effectively ruined, um, and they just continued the same pattern. We have to break the pattern. We have to try to rehabilitate these young people. We have to come together as a community and do that. And that's what I would like to do as a district attorney. Well, like a lot of the other things we talked about, it's new. And we need to implement these. And it's through education. It's through educating everybody in our office and community. I think, again, in this, we need a memorandum of understanding. A lot of these uh, offenders, currently 16 and then ultimately 17 next year, we're gonna, or in October this year, we're going to be looking at the county attorney getting involved, law enforcement getting involved, probation getting involved, the district attorney's office getting involved. Currently, it's my understanding there's not a memorandum of understanding amongst these various entities and how we're going to handle this situation. A lot of times you can see crimes where you may have a 16-year-old acting in concert with a 20-year-old. How's that going to be handled? You may have two different prosecuting agencies. So it's incumbent that, again, a teamwork approach is followed to ensure that we can live up to our obligation as district attorney and ensure that we can comply with all these new laws. 
I think if we do that, if we educate, if we ensure that we're aware of this, if we work with our community partners, ensuring everybody has a seat at the table and everybody has a voice, I think we can do this and we can be successful and we can handle these ultimate modifications to the criminal justice system because they continue to occur every single year. Thank you. This question is for Ms. Gelson. Uh, what experience do you have with diversion programs, be it traffic, workforce, and do you intend to continue the current programs administered by the D district attorney's office? Thank you. I have extensive experience with the various diversionary programs. I've had many clients go through the traffic diversion. I'm sure that no one here has had to do that. Uh, in addition, um, but the drug court diversionary program, where I've had individuals who, as a result of addictions, have been involved in the drug court, find that the drug court has been very effective, and that's these are individuals who need help. In addition, I would like to see also mental health court, because individuals who are suffering from mental health, for example, individuals I represented too many women that have committed offenses because uh, effectively their mental health has been such that they've been abused and they will actually commit offenses because their significant other has uh, coerced them into it. Um, suffering from battered woman syndrome. There are battered women courts. We need to have, uh, in addition, domestic violence courts. Situations where we need Criminal justice reform and diversionary programs are very good, but at the same point in time, that's not to say that we're necessarily going to be soft on crime. Diversionary programs need to be carefully screened, and quite frankly, the district attorney's office um, <coughs> and the diversionary programs that I've seen so far implemented, I would support those and I would continue to expand those. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, I am familiar as well with the diversion programs here in Broome County. For many years, I was a defense attorney um, on the Broome County Adult Treatment Corps, other words known as drug court. I've seen what it can do if done effectively. One of the big issues we have currently here in Broome County is we have an individual from the Broome County District Attorney's Office that sits on the Adult Treatment Corps. She does a good job and she tries her best. When I started on drug court roughly eight years ago, we had drug court and it was nowhere near as big as it is today. We had three employees working in drug court managing that program. Today we have one drug court employee. Drug court is now twice the size it once was. In addition, we have DWI court and we have veterans court. We have three times the size of the court with one employee. We're being asked to do a lot more with a lot less. Not acceptable. We can't accept that. This is our community. These are our family members. These are our loved ones. These are our brothers and sisters. We have to ensure that if they need assistance, the assistance is there. Mental health treatment court. I dramatically support a mental health treatment court. If you go online and you look at New York State courts, they talk about the different specialty courts that exist. Mental health treatment courts, there's one in Syracuse, and it's incredible. A lot of individuals that are battling addiction have underlying, untreated mental health issues. If we don't address the mental health issue, we're never going to reach sobriety. And these individuals are going to be out there again in the community <coughs> committing crimes. We need a mental health treatment court. Seven <coughs> years ago, Broome County was designated as a county to have a mental health treatment court. The Honorable Joseph Colley was going to be presiding over that court. Team members would come together and volunteer just like the drug court team. Unfortunately, there's no funding for a coordinator. We need to secure that funding. As far as the treatment alternative to uh, prosecution um, diversion program we currently have in Broome County, I'd like to see it extended for longer than 90 days. I'd like to see interim probation utilized in that. The alcohol monitoring program, I have an issue with that because it costs money and it's not fair to individuals who can't afford it. So do I support diversion? Yes. Would I like to see some changes with the current diversion programs? Yes. Is there a traffic diversion program? Yes. Would I like to see changes with that? Yes. I would not allow individuals who receive tickets and construction zones to go through diversion. Thank you. Thank you. I'm obviously very familiar with the traffic diversion program working in the district attorney's office. Just so everyone knows what it is, and I hope I don't take up too much of my own time here, uh, if you get a ticket and your record is not substantial, you have an opportunity to take an online course traffic safety course, uh, and then the ticket gets dismissed, but you have to pay for the course. 50% of that fee goes to the town or village where the ticket was issued, and 50% goes to the district attorney's office, which is in turn put back into certain programs, uh, equipment for uh, police officers, training, things of that nature. So that's a very good program, uh, and I would intend to keep that going because it helps fund positions in the office uh, that save the taxpayers money. It also gets equipment. We uh, took some of the money from the traffic diversion and invested in poll cameras for the village of Johnson City. 
for their uh, area around the police station. This all helps law enforcement, so those uh, programs are very good. Uh, finally, we've reached the point in the program where we don't agree on something, okay? We've been all pretty much on the same page till now. I think we need to consolidate these courts. You need one treatment court, okay? You don't need a mental health court and a drug court and a veterans court and an alcohol court, okay? We can consolidate our resources, and I would look to do that as district attorney. Uh, it, it doesn't solve the problem by throwing more and more money at the problem and expanding, 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 as my colleagues were talking about. I think you need to consolidate the courts. We have the assistant DAs who are trained and know what to do and could handle this situation. I think you'll save the taxpayers a lot of money by reviewing each program, seeing which ones are efficient, effective, cost effective, and reevaluating all these uh, diversion programs and consolidating them to save the taxpayers money. And that's what I would propose to do when I'm elected DA. Thank you. This next question directly relates to the diversionary programs, and it asks about changing the percentage that the county, the local courts get with the district attorney's office. Um, question goes to Mr. Patiski. Do you believe the local courts, where an offense originates, should receive a larger percentage of the traffic diversion program proceeds. And follows up, do you feel the current method of collecting diversion funds favors the wealthier offender? So when we talk about diversion, I'm just not going to rely upon the traffic diversion, because diversion has a big title, and there's a lot of specialty courts underneath the diversion. Um, each court has a specific rationale for justifying its existence. These courts were created after years and years of research. If an individual has a mental health issue, you're not going to treat them the same as an individual that has a drug problem, and so on and so forth. That's why you need specialized courts, just like there's specialized doctors. It's the exact same thing. You don't go to a heart doctor for a toothache. It's simple, and that's why we have these courts, and that's why they're being successfully implemented and continuing to grow throughout this country every day. As it relates to diversion, the municipality where the ticket occurs, should more money be coming back to the municipality? I think so. Currently, my review of the program is that there's no formula whatsoever in place that dictates when and how much the current administration must give back to municipalities. It's not fair. Those municipalities are operating the courts. Those members of law enforcement are doing their job in those municipalities. And these are infractions that are occurring in the municipalities where these people live. This money needs to be going back. There needs to be a formula. There needs to be an equation in place. It needs to be fair. One individual should not be able to single-handedly dole out money on a daily basis where they deem appropriate. The district attorney's office is here to prosecute cases. If you look at the mission statement on our own county website, it talks about the mission of the district attorney's office. It's not to be the number one income generating resource in Broome County. It's not to give out money as they deem appropriate. It's to ensure the safety of our community, and that's what we must do. So we've got to get back to a percentage system, and does the diversion favor the wealthy, wealthy. In some situations, I think it does. It's a pay-to-play system. If you have money and you can pay for an ankle monitor, you can pay your way out of the fair. It violates their rights. And if they can't pay for it, there's no reason why they shouldn't get the benefit of the bargain because we're talking about the criminal justice system. We're not talking about a car dealership. We're not talking about houses. We're talking about freedom. Thank you. Thank you. This is getting good. <laughs> uh, there is a formula in place. It's 50% of the money that comes into the traffic diversion program. The municipalities receive 50% of that. All of the traffic diversion program has been run through the Broome County Legislature and approved by the legislature. That's why it's in operation. Uh, this formula was created and approved by the Broome County legislature, uh, Legislators. Also, it does, we have not received one complaint from any municipality that they're not getting their fair share. In fact, we've received great response from each town and village because they're saved the expense of tracking people down for money. When someone comes in and pleads guilty to a traffic ticket, they get a, a piece of paper that says pay it by this date, and then they don't pay it. That happens quite often, unfortunately. Through our system, they know how much money they're getting and when they're getting it, and they don't have to continually send out notices to people about come in and pay your fine, come in and pay your surcharge. That's eliminated, and that saves those towns and villages uh, a lot of cost in tracking people down and making them, uh, making them pay. Now, uh, as far as the um, favoring the uh, wealthy, the traffic diversion program costs approximately $200. Now, again, 
That's not much more than the actual cost of a ticket if you go in and plead guilty in the court, as well as the surcharge. Uh, and you're actually serving the community by making people take a driver safety course. It makes a safer community for us all by having them do that. Uh, it doesn't favor the wealthy because you have individuals who could, if you're driving a car, if you're paying for gas, if you have insurance, if you have a license, you have some money. It's not an outrageous cost. Uh, again, but anyone who's in the DA's office knows that this is all approved by the legislature and uh, it's all on the up and up. This is no slush fund for the district attorney's office to spend money. It's all approved by the county legislature and it always will be. talking about dollars and cents, and my understanding is that the amount of money that the prosecutor's office, the district attorney's office has, equates to about $1.5 million a year. That's a lot of money. And again, that money that is used, that is the percentage that is used under the formula, is money that it, at the discretion of the district attorney. I think what we need to do, and there's been a lot of that money has been spent on additional spots for the DA's office, and I applaud that because that is needed. But we need to assess community by community as to what their needs are. It needs to be an open and a transparent system, and to this day, it really hasn't been. And we're talking about a great deal of money. Whether or not, it, given we need to support some of our diversionary programs, and I again. I agree with Mr. Battisti. One size does not fit all with mental health, with battered women's syndrome, with domestic violence, with post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I just, we need special individuals who specialize and have backgrounds in each. Same thing as you don't go to different doctors. But at the same point in time, we also need to be able to support our law enforcement. I can't tell you how many times I've received discovery because they're involved digital. In fact, everything's on digital, and they couldn't afford to have the proper equipment because they need to have the recordings. So we need to support law enforcement and a given community if they need to have additional equipment or additional enforcement or support diversion programs. It needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, and everyone needs to come to the table to make sure it is fairly distributed to where it is most needed and best for the community. Thank you. This question will begin with Mr. Korczak. Describe your experience prosecuting or defending felony level crimes in Broome County Courts. Okay, thank you. Well, I've been uh, very fortunate because I've actually been on both sides. I've been a prosecutor for 21 years, an attorney for 30. Uh, I've worked as an assistant DA, senior assistant DA, chief assistant district attorney, uh, as well as on the defense side. Uh, the district attorney needs to have trial experience. Uh, I feel that I've become a better prosecutor by the fact that uh, I worked as a defense attorney for a period of time. I'm able to anticipate defenses that uh, the defense attorneys bring at trial and be a better prosecutor. Uh, I think this is necessary. I was the first prosecutor in Broome County to work on a child sex abuse case where we had the child victim testify on a closed circuit TV from another room so she didn't have to be in the room and face her, uh, her, her abuser. Uh, I was the first attorney in Broome County to prosecute a murder one case and secure a uh, life without parole uh, sentence on a murder one case. Uh, this was the case of Hashim Herring. It was a robbery where he intentionally uh, murdered someone during the course of that robbery. The uh, co-defendant was Preston Lawrence. He was sentenced to a period of 18 or 20 years to life. I am still working with the Division of Parole and with the victim's family to send letters to the parole board to make sure that that individual does not walk the streets again. This is the type of experience that you can only get from being a prosecutor for 21 years. I intend to pass this wisdom on to the younger attorneys in the office, because they're the future of Broome County. They're the ones that are going to keep us and our grandchildren safe in the future, and they need the proper training. And I feel that my experience of 21 years as a prosecutor, 30 years as an attorney, uh, working on those cases will help uh, bring those prosecutors along. Uh, again, I've handled major felony cases at every level. Uh, I handled the Dwight Burden case, the uh, arson on Floral Avenue where two young children were killed. 
We took that case to trial. There was no plea bargain in that trial, and we secured a conviction and got life without parole. I will continue to work for victims and train younger prosecutors when I'm elected district attorney. Thank you. Korczak and I have a great deal in common. I also was the first uh, district attorney or prosecutor in New Jersey to do a videotape testimony with a vic child victim, and that was back in 1988. Uh, I also was the first to file for an extended term, which was a life without parole on a non-homicide case, uh, and that was against an attorney, some of you might know, Jack Ford. But I have had extensive criminal experience for 35 years, sex crimes, homicides, I'm both as a prosecutor, as an investigative prosecutor, working with multiple agencies on investigations over months, even longer. That's critical. You need to have a district attorney who has investigative experience, who has trial experience, as well as experience uh, with regard to working with law enforcement, working with probation, working with the community. All of the experience that I've had throughout my 35 years has come to this point where I want to bring it back to be Boone County District Attorney. I was a civil commitment judge, I was a municipal court judge, I served in over numerous municipalities, including Trenton. And if anyone's been to Trenton, you probably weren't there for very long. Um, that was the trenches. I've been in the trenches, I know what it takes, and I also agree with Mr. Korczak that our district attorneys we need to keep our district attorneys as career prosecutors. It takes years to develop that experience. It takes years to develop the instinct. It takes years to be able to understand what is required to make an effective, excellent investigation and prosecution so we don't have cases coming back and have to be retried. Because that's just a waste of resources and just further causes difficulties for our criminal justice system. Thank you. For many years, I've handled many criminal cases throughout New York State. While I've handled many trials in Broome County, I've handled many trials in other counties as well throughout New York State. Those trials range anywhere from eight felonies all the way down to misdemeanors to verdicts. The role of district attorney, however, I think it's important to stress, is not merely defined as just going to court. It's an individual that oversees, an individual that leads by example, an individual that can implement teamwork approach to ensure the office is the best it can be. A perfect example of this is our current district attorney, since taking office in 2016, has not tried one jury trial. That's a perfect example. The role of district attorney is to ensure justice is done. The current district attorney's office has numerous prosecutors in that office. And that district attorney's office has chief assistant district attorneys. <coughs> Currently in the Brook County District Attorney's Office, the chief assistant district attorney is Mr. Korczak, an individual that talks about his experience on a regular basis. The current district attorney has not tried a case in four years. Mr. Korczak continues to work for that individual. The role of district attorney, while yes, you need to be versed in the criminal justice system, which I submit I am, is an individual that's got to understand the community, understand families, understand addiction, be able to work with under other individuals, be able to be trusted by our community agencies, be able to bring everybody to the table to ensure that everything that we have in Broome County works as smooth as it possibly can. And I think if elected district attorney, I can clearly do that. Thank you. Next question will be about the relationship between the police and the district attorney's office. The question goes to Mr. Gelson. How would you describe your relationship with law enforcement agencies, and what do you view as your role as a district attorney as it relates to police agencies? Well, first and foremost, I've had an excellent relationship with law enforcement on state, local, and federal levels uh, over my 35 years in all of my various, with all my various experience, not only as a district attorney, prosecutor, director of a sex crimes unit, uh, investigating prosecutor, but as a defense attorney, as well as a judge, um, also serving for 10 years in New Jersey. Uh, with regard to my experience with regard to local law enforcement, I've been working as an 18B attorney. I've had over 50 indictable cases, uh, and I'm 
still holding a caseload uh, to this point. In terms of my the policy, I haven't worked uh, as much with law enforcement locally in Broome County because effectively, as a defense attorney, that would be my experience. However, I have great, I've always had great respect for law enforcement. In fact, uh, on numerous occasions, uh, I was representing law enforcement when in New Jersey, if they were <coughs> disciplinary charges that were brought against them. It's imperative that we have an excellent relationship with law enforcement. They work hard, they risk their lives every day, they keep our community safe. I think that we need to have community policing and I would encourage that if I was district attorney and work with law enforcement as an advisor and any support that they may need, but also at the same point in time is to involve themselves, involve all of us within the community. I'd like to say I have a very good relationship with members of law enforcement. Uh, recently, I was endorsed by NYSUPA, which is the New York State Union of Police Associations, and I was honored to accept that endorsement. Throughout my career, I've been a union attorney. I've represented many members of law enforcement in both not only Broome County, but Shenango County. I've been a preferred attorney with Council 82 and NYSUPA. I think I have a very good working relationship with members of law enforcement, and I think that speaks volumes considering for the last 15 years I've been a defense attorney. As it relates to what is my role in working with law enforcement, I think it'd be a team approach. I could be an educator. My team could be an educator. We could help write policy. We could sit down. We would actively be involved in chief meetings. We would sit down to try to put in place policies of various task force and how those task force are going to implement. Are we looking for people to cooperate? How so? What individuals can we use? It's also my role as district attorney to ensure that no illegal conduct is occurring within members of law enforcement. Law enforcement do incredible things every day. They keep each and every member in this room safe on a daily basis. I have a very good working relationship with them. I think there's an element of trust with law enforcement. I think that's important considering the new laws, specifically surrounding the discovery statute that's being put in place. There's got to be trust. If there's not trust, you're not going to have a working relationship. So I classify my relationship as good. And in the event I work with law enforcement, it's a team approach. We all sit together. I'm not going to tell them what to do. We're going to sit down. Everybody's going to have a voice. And we're going to ensure that members of law enforcement are heard before disposition and post disposition. We're going to ensure that they have a say in a case. And we're going to ensure that after the case is disposed, we meet with them again to ensure if any mistakes were made, they're educated upon that to ensure that it never happens again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Again, I'm, we'll try not to get too, uh, too political here, but we have to, because we're all running for DA. Um, ask you to do a fact check. Check out NYSUPA. See what they're all about. They're a union based in Newburgh, New York. Uh, they're not local law enforcement, and they negotiate contracts for uh, patrol officers. Again, do a fact check. Know the facts. That's why I'm running for DA, and that's why I'm stressing that everyone out there should know the facts. Go to my website, mycourtjack.com, Google all the candidates, be an informed voter, that's what we're really asking. There seems to be some myth out there that the current district attorney's office doesn't get along with law enforcement. I have had a wonderful relationship over the years with members of law enforcement. And again, check the facts. Talk to any police officer you know, talk to any retired police officer you know, any detective, uh, from the sheriff's department to the state police to the local agencies, and ask them, how have you dealt with Mike Korczak over the years, and how has he treated you as a prosecutor? And I think you'll find uh, that the answer is I have a great working relationship with the police department. Now, Steve Cornwell is the current DA. He's not running for re-election. When he came in, he butted heads with local law enforcement. People are resistant to change. They don't like change, but that's what he ran on. Now, again, I'm going to use my own style, my own approach to working with the police departments of every agency, as I've done over the years. Uh, and I'll continue to work with them to do what we have to do. Will we always agree? Of course we're not going to agree. It's a relationship, kind of like a married relationship. You don't always agree, <laughs> but you're all rowing in the right direction. You're all headed in the right direction. Uh, sometimes you're going to have to tell them that what they're doing is not acceptable, and you're going to have to do that. But a DA has to be able to do that. A DA can't owe political favors to people. A DA can't make any promises to people. That's why it's so difficult to be the district attorney, because you have to enforce the law. You're bound by a code of ethics to do that. I've done it for 21 years. I will continue to do it as district attorney.
question of the evening starts with uh, Mr. Patisti. How would you provide services for victims, including notification of proceedings and pleas involving the victim within the court process? Um, first and foremost, uh, the first thing I would do is restore advocates to the Broome County District Attorney's Office. Uh, unfortunately, on January 1, 2016, all the advocates that were in the District Attorney's Office were asked to leave. They need to come back. I hear all too often that victims are not notified of proceedings. They don't know what's going on. They didn't receive orders of protection. Currently, Executive Law 641 and 646 specifically states that the district attorney must send out information as soon as possible to victims. This information comes from Office of Victim Services. And what's included in that is rights of victims, who they are, what they do, do they have a voice, how do they get monetary proceeds, how do they get an order of protection. This must occur. It's not fair when it doesn't occur. If it doesn't occur, we're not doing our job. We need to ensure that all victims have a voice. We need to ensure that all victims participate, pursuant to statute, in criminal prosecutions. There's different software out there where actually an offender, if released, can be on an electronic monitor. That electronic monitor will notify a victim if that offender gets within a certain area of that victim when orders of protections are in place. There's certain tools and we need to utilize those tools. So getting rid of the advocates in the office in January 1, 2016, I'm against that and they need to come back. Number two, there was funding in the district attorney's budget for years that went to victim advocates. That was cut. That needs to come back. That needs to be restored. Again, it's a perfect example of bringing everybody together for the betterment of our community. I understand people butt heads, but just because you butt heads doesn't mean the job shouldn't get done. It's okay if we have difference of opinion, but we all got to keep our eye on what the goal is. And the goal is the safety of Broome County, ensuring we can be as safe and as effective as possible. It's not about our own personal well-being, our own personal gain. So as far as victims, we have to ensure that all their rights are protected. Thank you very much. Mr. Cortez. Okay. Um, thank you. Obviously, I've been working with and for victims for 21 years, but there is a delicate balance between uh, advising a crime victim and letting them know what's going on and having them have input into what happens in the case. Because the DA is bound by the facts and the law on the case. So that's when you uh, hear in the paper, you're like, boy, this guy got charged with a sex offense and he got a very light sentence. Why is that? You know, why are there plea bargains? Victims shouldn't put up with this. Well, there's a delicate balance and there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that you don't know. Oftentimes, a victim or a witness is reluctant to testify doesn't want to testify, that in those particular cases, a plea bargain is, is order, in order. It's a bargain for the victim, too. They don't have to go into the courtroom, face their uh, perpetrator, face the offender, and relive the whole thing again. So when you talk about uh, victims' rights and protecting victims, plea bargains actually do that. And there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that we don't know about and that we can't talk about because we're bound by the code of ethics for prosecutors. But there's different factors that go into it. Um, we also are bound by the law. Okay? Now, when you talk about bound by the law, we can't over-prosecute a case. Someone gets charged with an assault. Here's the, the latest example. Someone gets punched in the face, but they fall down and crack their head open and die. That's not a murder. We have sympathy for the victim's family, and we have sympathy for the victim. But by law, that's an assault in the third degree under New York State law. So the the prosecutor must follow the law and the facts of the case. Okay, so don't be misled by information in the press and things of that nature. Victims are informed, they know their rights. I've been fighting for victims for a long time. In fact, in the last couple of weeks, I've uh, gone to the county legislature and asked that they impose rules and regulations and pass them along to law enforcement that no police officer should have a sexual relationship with a crime victim while the case is pending. I just think it's important for, for all the voters to be informed and know where the candidates stand. Thank you. I became an attorney because of victims. I want to be district attorney because I want to turn victims into survivors. Victims 
are what we're doing this for, and making sure that the rest of our community does not become victims. But while they individuals who have suffered as victims, we want to empower them, and they need to be a part of the process. They need to be part of what's being considered. And I agree with Mr. Battisti that that's an integral problem. When I was representing children or women, I was an integral part of the process as a district attorney in getting them over their guilt, their fear. That's what it's about. Now, when I became a defense attorney, what I realized is that most of the poor people, especially taking the pool cases and the 18B cases, were also at one time victims. Abuse breeds abuse. Violence breeds violence. But again, we need to address, we need to address the needs of our victims when they're victims. We need to get them support, we need to get them treatment, and we need to empower them. And that's what I would do as district attorney. We will begin our